We bought a Ford Excursion, the most absurd, the most ridiculous, the most wonderful, and the most terrible SUV ever made. And in this video, we are going over everything you ever wanted to know about the Ford Excursion, and we're going to talk about why are they so freaking expensive. Ford and General Motors battled it out segment by segment for decades and decades and decades. In pretty much every segment, Ford had an answer to GM and vice versa, from small cars to big trucks. But strangely, if you wanted a large three-row four-door family hauling SUV, well, that class was dominated by the Suburban. Sure, the Bronco and the Blazer fought it out tooth and nail, but Ford really didn't have an answer to the Suburban for years and years and years. That all changed when Ford revealed the Expedition on May 9th, 1996. The F-150 base three row now finally fought the Chevy head on and it was an immediate hit. But there was a problem. You see the Suburban lineup wasn't just one model and while the Expedition did a good job of competing with the 1500 Suburban, well, there was a 2500 Suburban, a more heavy duty version and Ford didn't have an answer to that until they came up with this monster. Here's the thing though, the 1500 and the 2500 Suburban look pretty much identical. Okay, sure, if you look at the hubs, they're pretty different, and yes, there are some changes, but to the average consumer, 1500, 2500, the same. However, when you look at the Ford lineup in the late 90s, well, Ford had just launched the Super Duty, the all new F250. So while the 150 and the Expedition were kind of roly poly, the 250 was big and squared off, so the medium ass SUV, the Expedition, would be round, but the big ass SUV, the Excursion, would be, well, squared off and based on the 250. And that's what they did. And so on September 30th, 1999, Ford revealed the Excursion, and put simply, it blew people's minds. It was the biggest thing a lot of people had ever seen. You see, the Expedition was sized somewhere between a Tahoe and a Suburban. But the excursion was sized somewhere between a city block and a small planet. It's enormous! It's huge! And let's talk about this right nowadays. It's pretty commonly known that newer vehicles are larger than older vehicles. So like a 3 Series is the size of an old 5 Series. A C-Class is the size of an old E-Class. But the excursion, even 23 years later, is still huge! What you're looking at is nearly 19 feet worth of Kentucky built steel. This thing is, I mean, it's just, it's mind blowing. The Excursion died for the 2005 model year and then the Expedition carried on. And now of course there's the Expedition Max, but the Expedition Max is a full five inches shorter than the old 2000 Excursion. I mean, the height is redonkulous. It's five inches taller than a new Suburban. I mean, in pretty much every dimension, it's just a uh, it's ridiculous, it's over the top. For example, when Ford was developing this vehicle, they were crash testing it against the Ford Taurus and it kept driving on top of the Ford Taurus. That's right, not kind of on the bumper, but through the bumper onto the hood and then front tire in the windshield. So what they had to do was develop an underwriter system below the front bumper so it wouldn't drive over pedestrians and people living their lives. And then in the rear, it's got a standard tow hitch. And you're thinking, well, that makes sense, right? People are towing. That's true, but it's also there because if it wasn't, cars would simply drive underneath this thing. The other thing about having 19 feet worth of America is that it weighs quite a lot. And by quite a lot, I do mean an enormous amount. Considering that this vehicle is 22 years old, it weighs more than a Ram 1500 TRX with a supercharged V8. These weigh between 6,600 and like 7,700 pounds. Now, what does it take to move all that weight? Well, go back to the first model year, 2000. The base engine was a 5.4 liter Triton V8 which was woefully underpowered and very few people bought those. Now the top dog engine was the 7.3 liter turbo diesel with over 500 pound feet of torque. Now this engine is neither of those. This was the middle option. This is a 6.8 liter V10. Horsepower rating 310, torque rating 425. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of struggling with this actually because I'm not entirely sure there has ever been another factory produced SUV by a major company to come equipped with a V10. You see here the word V10, you think like Lamborghini, right? Like the Gallardo or the Huracan, or maybe you think like Dodge Viper. But when you think of V10s, I'm not sure there's ever been another SUV with a V10. There's V12s like in the Cullen and W12s like in the Bentley Bentayga, but a factory SUV with a V10? Not, I'm 
not sure there's another one. Diesel Touareg? Oh, Case is right, actually. The Diesel Touareg, ah, but that was a diesel V10. Although it is still a V10. Good point, Case. <laughs> So, does the V10 have huge amounts of power as you'd expect out of a 10 cylinder? Um, it is perfectly adequate and absolutely nothing more. This engine, I mean, it, it goes. It will go if you put your foot into it. You know, it makes a lot of noise and then you kind of accelerate, I'd say, gracefully. But this is not, this is not a powerhouse. You know, if you want to make a lot of power, you have to go for the 7.3 liter diesel or buy a 6 liter and then bulletproof it and you can make crazy power. But the V10, I mean, it's, it's adequate, right? And it kind of makes a cool sound when you put your foot into it. But it is not a rocket ship. So you Europeans out there probably wondering, how the heck did us Yanks only manage 310 horsepower out of 6.8 liters worth of V10? That breaks down to like 45 horsepower per liter? Well, this was very much on purpose. You see, this was a commercial grade engine and up till 2019, a version of the Triton V10 was still used in the F650, F750. They're used in motorhomes. This was an engine that was designed to be super understressed. It does have single overhead cams, but two valves? Like, I mean, it's... It's like technology from the 1940s. But the great part is with nine to one compression, even at 170 some thousand miles like this vehicle has, they do run beautifully. All right, the early ones that have an issue where occasionally a spark plug would go shooting out of the block. This one has had that happen once or twice according to the previous owner, but you know, fingers crossed. Apart from that, it, it should be pretty good. Now to feed 6.8 liters worth of V10, the excursion has a 44 gallon fuel tank. 44 and when you consider this gets i don't know nine or ten miles per gallon it was never actually officially rated for the by the epa because um the gbw was like over 8500 so it's classified as a heavy duty truck but yeah i've read reports of right around nine or ten miles per gallon so let's do a little bit of math so uh, the average uh u.s fuel price as of yesterday was three dollars and 44 cents times 44 gallons you're looking at like 100 and $51 to fully fuel up the excursion. Now, of course, when this debuted in the late 1990s, early 2000s, fuel prices was a buck fifty, right? A dollar fifty one. So this made a lot more sense. And then, of course, as we progressed through the 2000s, we had the energy crisis, gas went through the roof, and these quickly became the poster child for conspicuous consumption, along with like the Hummer H2. Now, of course, if you want a better fuel economy, just get the diesel, right? The 7.3 or the later 6.0. The issue with those, though, is they are stupid expensive. And I do mean stupid expensive. One recently sold on Bring a Trailer for $100,000. Another one with like 70,000 miles sold for over $50,000. Now we paid quite a bit less for this. Now this particular 2000 excursion in, okay, maybe not quite perfect shape, was eight grand, 170 some thousand miles. It was purchased by the previous owner in 2001. But the thing is, when people buy excursions, they keep them for years and decades. These things are so well loved. I think for a while when gas got really expensive in the late 2000s, they did probably depreciate quite a bit, but now they're on the up and the up and it's not uncommon, even high mileage excursions to see them well above 15 grand. So eight grand is about as cheap as you can get for a running and driving one with albeit a little bit of rust, but everything works, four wheel drive, it's all good. Um, yeah, they're, you're gonna have to pay if you want one of these because people love them. So the excursion has what they call the tri-door, which was kind of a clever engineering feat. Now the idea is you could lift up the rear glass, put in your groceries or your stuff into the back without actually opening the main portion of the tailgate. Now, the first thing you notice, granted I have no upper body strength whatsoever, but even the rear glass portion is pretty chunky. This is a big piece of steel and glass. And then if you want to access the rest of the trunk, there's a handle up here, pull that, one door swings open, and then there's another handle down here, pull that, and the other door swings open. This excursion with the V10 is rated to tow 9,600 pounds. This has a 373 axle ratio. You could also get it with a 430, and that would have towed 10,000 pounds. And the diesel excursion of 2000 also towed 10,000 pounds, which is a lot of weight. Now, when you keep in mind that like a new F250, you know, you're talking like 14, 15, all the way up to like 20 some thousand pounds, right? But this was still 22 years ago, so 10,000 pounds was extremely respectable. The interesting thing about the excursion 
question is even though dimensionally it's enormous it doesn't drive all that big if you have driven a modern day super duty if you've driven a raptor or a trx this is actually going to feel pretty tame to you because these old 90s early 2000s suvs right they were designed in such a way where the sight lines are pretty low and tucked down so you don't have these massive hoods that you're staring over it actually feels super manageable to drive and that is one of my favorite parts about it we're kind of swinging around in the snow here now this is a four-wheel drive equipped excursion which means you kind of get sideways a little bit Ooh, it's actually a lot of fun look at that golly that's great it's really surprisingly nimble for what it is come on baby come on don't get stuck don't get stuck come on dig it out dig it out dig it out dig it out oh and we just shot mud absolutely everywhere so the excursion <laughs> Oh geez, <laughs> the excursion is a nice thing to drive. It has uh, solid axles front and back, just like an old school truck. It's got leaf springs front and back like an old school truck, but the ride quality is surprisingly subdued and uh, I love it. I mean, it really is a great road tripper. There were two different mirror types available on the excursion, a standard mirror, which looked like a car mirror, and then these are the tow mirrors. So you simply grab them and pull them out. And now you can see the horse trailer, you're towing behind you pretty nice little piece of design. So a lot of the excursion is F250 bodywork. So I believe most of the front end, like the hood and the front fenders, those are pretty much the same as an F250. The front doors, same as an F250. The rear lights are off of the Ford Econoline van, which is kind of funky. Now the keen-eyed viewers among you will notice that this grill is not original to this truck. This would have been probably on like a later uh, excursion or F-250 model line, this tri-bar. The early ones had kind of this egg crate style grill. However, this is the great part about excursions. For the most part, all this front end stuff is super easy to get and super dirt cheap. So for example, we've got this nice dent in the bumper, um, but bumpers are cheap, grills are cheap, all this really easy to replace. As per many Fords of this era, you could get the access keypad, one of the coolest features. Unfortunately, that's broken. <laughs> Go figure. And then I do love these old school F-250 style um, letterbox style door handles. So you pull open and then the whole door, which is enormous, glides open. The Excursion was available in two primary trims. Okay, there were a few others like the Eddie Bauer, but the main two trims were the XLT and the Limited. This one's the XLT. The Limited had like leather seats and heated seats. You can get like the cool little entertainment system in the back. But this was your standard family haul and excursion. So as you'd expect, pretty much everything on the dash is shared with the F-250 and it's very basic by modern day standards. So like the steering wheel, I mean, it looks like something out of an airport van because it is something out of an airport van. So you've got two basic uh, spokes, some cruise control buttons, and then your horn. Now, apart from that, it does have a column shift. This is a four speed automatic with an overdrive. Okay, maybe, maybe think of it like a three speed with an overdrive. So park reverse, neutral, drive two and one. And then the drive is an overdrive and you can click the overdrive off by pushing the button on the end of the stock if you don't want it to upshift into fourth. One of the best parts about this excursion, even though everything is pretty, pretty chintzy actually. I mean, the whole interior is just terrible blacks and grays and ugh, it doesn't feel very good, but it's very simple and easy to use, which is something I think is missing in a lot of vehicles. So the climate controls, you've got a fan knob, a temperature knob, and then a direction. The radio, you've got these ginormous preset buttons and a tune knob. I just love it. Even like the four wheel drive, this could be the top of a Lipton iced tea bottle cap, but still everything is super simple and it's lasted even 22 years later. It, okay, it may look bad. It may not feel very good, but there's no doubt that it's durable. Now you could get the excursion in a bench seat or you could get it in this two seater with a console. And if you got the console, you got this little thing labeled clip, which is great for holding your papers. One thing I really do like about the interior of the excursion, because it's based on a vehicle that was used for work, it's got a very comprehensive set of gauges. So of course you've got your speedometer, a really annoying seatbelt beep, it'll shut up. <laughs> Wait for it. There it goes, speedometer, tachometer, but then over here on the left, you have a battery voltage from eight to 18 volts. So you have oil pressure, water temperature, and then of course your fuel gauge. And then later excursions apparently also had transmission temperature. And by the way, that super annoying seatbelt chime, there's actually a page in the owner's manual that tells you how to permanently disable it. That is not something you could do in 2022. I do love this and I have to give Doug credit. He found this in the owner's manual, but on page 93, basically Ford gave you Okay, that seatbelt minder really should be disabled. Ford gave you an FAQ as to why you should wear your seatbelt. So for example, belt wrinkle my clothes and they give you the answer. But essentially, it's just a funny FAQ on reasons why uh, 
you would die if you didn't wear your seatbelt. So Ford has done a pretty good job with engineering cup holders, which was a pretty major essential back in the 90s, as it is today. So you got two main cup holders here, and then two additional ones right here, and they pop on up. Interesting thing here is that they are for soft cups only, and they have these little rubber teeth that kind of grip onto the cups. But four cup holders for two front seat passengers, that is my kind of math right there. A couple of interesting things on this overhead center console. First of all, up here we have controls for rear seat climate. Very cool, very easy to use. Uh, you've got fan, temperature, and then you can even change the direction from the panel to the floor. Now behind that are these two switches labeled vent, and this is one of the coolest features in the excursion. These are actually rear quarter windows that will open and close as you push in on these buttons. Very clever. Behind that, an extremely large sun glass holder. And then this is my favorite feature, which was so simple and so effective. This is a cubby for a garage door opener. So you can see there's a little bit of tape in there, and then that's where you'd put your garage door opener. And I believe the idea was that you would never actually need to open it to open your garage. There's clearly like an indentation here. You'd actually arrange it so that you just push in like that, and that would basically activate a little finger that would push the button on your garage door opener and would allow you to open up the garage door. Now in the front of this whole shebang, we do have a computer. So this not only tells you your temperature and your direction of travel, but it will also display stuff like fuel economy, a mighty 10.1, and then miles to empty, 475, which I think is woefully optimistic, and then you can change the units to kilometers, which was quite, you know, quite, I don't know, world traveled of four to include kilometers and Celsius and liters per uh, 100 mi uh, kilometers, so... Uh, yeah, there you go. The back seat of the excursion is surprisingly hard to get in and out of because the gap between the B pillar and the seat bottom, you got like six inches maybe, so you kind of got to squeeze your feet through there. But once you do, it is a roomy back seat. Now it's not as roomy as like a modern day full size truck, and I think the idea is they wanted to push most of the seats toward the front of the vehicle, so even with the third row, you had like 19 feet worth of cargo space back there. Uh, but quite comfortable, simple bench seat, three abreast seating. So this one is two, three, three. So technically this is an eight seater, but you can get it with a bench in the front too. So you could have a nine seater excursion. Now up top here, you do have air vent controls with air vents in the ceiling. You also have dome lights, nice little touch there. Two cup holders in the back. And then this is a relic of the past. Um, <laughs> rear seat entertainment for rear seat passengers, not in the form of screens, but actually a separate radio with little headphone jacks so rear seat passengers could listen to popular music like the Google Dolls, while front seat passengers would listen to more mature music. Now to fold the seat in an old excursion, you lift up on the seat bottom and then you gotta kinda remove the headrests here, like so. And they live in these little seat pockets back here. And then you can fold the seats. Man, I should have done this better. People are going to give me heck. And there is a random wheel hub in the way. Oh, there we go. That was a mess. Maybe I should have practiced before I got on camera. But I fold the seats back. And there's this weird little flap, which then folds up from the back of the seat. And what this was for was to bridge the gap between the seat top here and the actual cargo floor because of course there'd be this big hump but you fold this down and now you've got a great place to slide it across now of course this excursion is full of uh, it's full of 23 years 22 years worth of cheerios so it's going to be a fair amount of cleaning you just bought this thing and uh you know you buy them cheap you got to clean them with all your might now the third row is obviously probably the best part about the seating from the excursion because even though you may be kind of disappointed by the second row room, you have basically the exact same room in the third row. The seat is nice and tall. Even at six feet tall, I have pretty good headroom. I do have these little cubbies back here with some small cup holders. And then the third row does fold, does not fold flat, but most folks what they end up doing when the kids move out, they just remove the third row altogether as a lever you pull and then you drive this as a five seater and have, you know, nine acres worth of room back here for luggage and cargo stuff. Now back in the year 2000, an XLT like this model with four wheel drive and the V10 would have come in at around 37,400. And 50 bucks. That's the equivalent of nearly $60,000 in today's money. And then if you got the limited with four-wheel drive, uh, you know, you're talking like 40 grand. Is the Excursion a good vehicle? I mean, not really. <laughs> At least by modern standards, it's super basic and pretty, 
well, pretty utilitarian on the interior, but these vehicles perfectly served the purpose they were trying to fill back in the day for folks that had three, four, five, six kids, and then a boat, and maybe even a ginormous camper. This thing made a lot of sense. And if you look at like folks that own these, I had a friend in elementary school who owned one of these, and it was like, it was ridiculous, but it kind of made sense because they had like six kids and then they, they did this big yearly trip and folks loved these. They held on to them, like I said, for years and years and years. And when this died, um, I mean, the, the, the folks that were in a saving the environment certainly didn't miss them much, but the folks that needed a very utilitarian vehicle to carry all of their friends and stuff definitely did. And I think for that reason, it makes it a very kind of cool piece of history a little footnote, now they sold a lot of these the first couple of years and then they really tanked as they approached like 2004, 2005 in sales because they were so big and unfuel efficient and fairly expensive. Now today, of course, eight grand for one of these is dirt cheap. Certainly the dirt inside of here does make up for some of that. But if you guys want one of these, figure 15, 20 K for a good one. Um, let me know what you think in the comment section below. We've got a full series coming up with this. I'm going to tease it because this is my channel. But we're doing a series called Go Big where we're buying an excursion, a massive ass GM vehicle, and then something else. And we're going to do like a full Overland kitted out series. This is the first of the vehicles we bought. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Check out tfl-studios.com for all the latest and greatest in Ford excursion reviews.